So uh, first I'll just briefly introduce my lab. So we are a purely uh, com computational lab. We do um, uh, method development uh, within bioinformatics. Um, we work with a couple of different uh, topics or actually quite a lot of different topics. But the core of our work is really this um, uh, bioinformatics and the, and the uh, analysis of data. <clears throat> and um, so we work on these kind of various topics here and some of these topics will also be part of the talk today. So for instance, large scale human genomics, we work with various omics data, for instance, uh, proteomics, also uh, microbiome data. And recently we also gotten into working with these electronic health record data, um, which I think is also super exciting. And it's actually quite different from working with the omics data uh, as well. And I will briefly uh, touch upon that um, in the talk as well. Um, <clears throat> the main, oh, since we, we, we uh, so we do a lot of data integration because we don't only work with one of these data sets. We work with multiple of these data types uh, at the same time. And what we are using to do this uh, integration is uh, at the moment these, uh, uh, Variational autoencoders that are um, um, some of the, uh, that are basically this uh, deep learning approach. So, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about. So, when I was invited and I uh, heard this is this kind of a primer talk, I kind of wanted to um, try to give an uh, introduction to what is it that we've done, and also kind of like my own personal journey here into these um, variational autoencoders. Um, so I, I basically have uh, three parts of the talk and it's leading on to the next talk where Ricardo will uh, go into detail with one of these methods. But basically uh, the first part is about that we figured out uh, a couple of years ago that we could use these variations or uh, variation autoencoders to integrate data. Um, the second part is then that we try to see, we, uh, or we try to, um, uh, to do this, not just for like a few data sets for like uh, two different data types, but for many different data types and try to use this um, <clears throat> resulting latent, uh, latent space for uh, patient stratification. And finally, we, uh, the latest work we just, we have just uh, out now is basically on uh, taking it a step further, trying to understand what's actually happening inside this uh, autoencoder when it learns to integrate. And this is basically, what I will talk about. And so we first will cover some microbiome stuff. We'll then cover some uh, uh, work on uh, mental disorders and finally on type. So as you see, the biological question is not the most important thing for me. The, it's more like the methods uh, uh, that we use. Okay, <clears throat> I just have like super quick uh, introduction to some uh, the basic stuff of this. So uh, maybe uh, most of you know this already, but I just wanted us all to be uh, on the same page. So this deep learning is basically powered by neural networks. They've been around for many years. They are inspired by the brain. Uh, and I have like a super easy, I have like an example over here. I have like each, um, each blue dot or each blue uh, node here, it's a neuron. And, and they are then organized in layers where we have like the first layer takes in or takes a input uh, into the network. The layers in the middle, they then process this information and feeds it out to the um, output layers here. So this is like a standard feed uh, uh, for neural network. <clears throat> so basically the in, in, uh, information flow goes from uh, left to right. And what's really cool about this is that they can learn all kinds of mathematical functions. They can learn to do all these kind of tasks that we ask of them. And we actually don't have to tell it um, uh, how it should do that, but we can basically just tell it what it is we want it to do. And then it will try to um, figure that out by uh, changing the weights in the network, so by training the network. <clears throat> so, and what this talk is about is one part of my group where we are doing a lot of work on these unsupervised methods. And within the Deep learning, this, this, this very actually uh, relatively easy way of doing that is that's these uh, autoencoders, which is basically the same thing as we had before. We basically have these neurons here, or the uh, layers of neurons. Um, and the big difference here is that here in the middle, we have like a bottleneck. And then we basically, uh, in this case, we just flip the first part of, part of the network 
um, so that what we do is we basically send in or when we send in information into the into the model um, we uh, the information gets uh, encoded here into like what we call a latent representation so like bottleneck and then this network over here then tries to reconstruct uh, from this uh, information here it tries to reconstruct the original data and this might sound a little bit counterintuitive because we already have the data why would we need to kind of reconstruct the data again but this is because we are mostly interested at least in the first two talks or in the first two uh, parts of my talk we're mostly interested in this part here what it is it is it that it's learning here because the thing that it learns here in the uh, middle layer is um, it basically has to learn the most important parts of the data these kind of data manifolds or the structure of the data because if it if it's not learning that then it cannot reconstruct the data so it has to learn the most important part and this is basically the the, the key the, or one of the key things here <clears throat> then there are these um, uh, like another version of these uh, uh, origin coders called the uh, variation origin coder has been a, around actually for quite a long time <clears throat> and here is the same principle except that we here in the middle you know, we we change the uh, the setup so that it's no longer fully connected all the way <laughs> but uh, we instead um, introduce uh, two extra layers here. So one layer that we uh, enforce to encode like the mean of a uh, uh, Gaussian and then the <clears throat> other layer here which we enforce to uh, encode the standard deviation. And this is by adding like an extra, uh, an extra um, element to the network. So an extra part of the loss, which then <clears throat> um, uh, uh, penalizes the network if this does not follow the, uh, the distribution uh, that we have uh, made or that we uh, wanted to follow. And normally, or like in this um, um, kind of standard approaches here, we, we, we wanted to have a mean zero and a standard deviation. And one of the, or the main reason for this is actually, or at least in, in, um, in the use cases of what we are using it for, is that this uh, compared to just the, like the vanilla auth encoder is that it, constrains the latent set. So the, um, in the vanilla auto encoder, you can put all the, the, um, the input points um, all over the space, and it doesn't really uh, need to have a structure in it. <clears throat> but, uh, but by uh, doing this, we constrain it so that it has to kind of put similar things in a similar space. And this is very useful if we want to use the latent space. Yeah, all right. So, could you say one more word about um, how you actually train this? So that you said that you talked about the extra loss, but how, what is the basic setup for the loss? Uh, yeah, so work? basically, we uh, the setup is that we have like uh, the input here, and then we have the output over here. So that's one. So that's the so the difference between the input and the output is one part of the loss. And then here we have also a loss here on uh, on this. Uh, the distribution here, so we force it to follow like a Gaussian. So, so, and this is using this uh, uh, Kubek Lieber diversion. So, we kind of enforce it to follow a certain distribution. We normally use the Gaussian, but you can uh, enforce it to do all other kinds of uh, uh, di distribution. And I have, like, I actually have like on a couple of extra slides or next slides, I have like an example. So, but thanks, thanks for the question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was my quick introduction here. So then, um, actually, uh, I want to travel a little bit uh, back in time because back in 2016, I was uh, not a PI. I was just working as a researcher here, uh, or not here, but in in, in uh, uh, back home in Denmark. And I was working a lot with uh, data from the um, gut, uh, gut microbiome. And what um, um, the topic I was working on was this like this thing called um, uh, metagenomic binning, where basically if you sequence the uh, microbes of your gut, what you end up having is a lot of DNA pieces, right? So you, it's very rare that you actually get them into uh, uh, full length pieces, and it's um, becoming better now, but it's still often that you will um, not get them into these uh, full length pieces. So basically, what we ended up with, or what we have, right, is we have a lot of these. Um, 
DNA pages, we call them contexts. We can even have millions from one um, data set. <clears throat> and what the task that we wanted to do here was, was then to try to see, okay, can we somehow figure out which of these contexts uh, it belongs to genome A and which belongs to genome B and which belongs to genome C and so on. So basically like this, like a, a try to uh, cluster the data into these um, genomes. And <clears throat> so I was writing a grant application about that because I was thinking of becoming a PI. So I wanted to, um, to, uh, that, uh, to get some grants. <clears throat> and so I wanted to also to spice it up a little bit. Um, and I was, uh, at that time, I hadn't really done a lot of deep learning and it was also, it was just at the time becoming more and more uh, like uh, sexy as well. So I spoke with some of my colleagues and they we basically ended up thinking about, so maybe we could actually use these uh, VAEs to actually do something to the data that would improve this task. And so I submitted a grant, I didn't get it, but um, this kind of thing actually started and uh, like uh, some thoughts, uh, in us and I tried to see, okay, what if I could find, just try to do this and then see, okay, will it actually work or not? And I think most of my colleagues, they were like, Simon, what are you doing? This is like crazy. You will never get anything out of it. Okay, so um, basically I will, will not go into detail, but when we try to solve this task, we have two types of data. So we have, we have some data that relates to the abundance of the sequence in the same of that we have. And we have some other data that's uh, related to the uh, DNA itself. So it turns out that bacteria encodes the genomes in di uh, using different patterns. And this is different between different species. So we can also so we can both use information about uh, the abundance of the context in, in, in the samples and then uh, the um, information about the actual sequence. And so you see, this is two types of data, right? <clears throat> and what we then thought about hey, could we actually try to use the variation auto encoder to integrate it? Because at that time, um, people came up with these kind of crazy, what I would say, actually a little bit crazy models where they made like um, um, various uh, 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 polynomials to kind of to try to integrate. So like one uh, representation they could then cluster. So we thought maybe we could actually just uh, let the network run. So this is what we try. So, we, so what's yeah. the intuition for what the latent space represents in this example? Yeah, so here the intuition is actually like, so if the latent space is like, that uh, uh, represents the kind of the major structure, right? And here the major structures are actually the genome, right? So because the DNA is sampled from the genome of the organisms there, right? So in that sense, um, we was, what we thought was then that the latent space would actually make, uh, be a representation of the genome. So if you, are, if you have two contexts from the same genome, they would be in a similar place in the latent space. So the, this, the species are clustering. Exactly. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah. So it's sort of the species and, and how similar they are. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I had a, another question. Um, for the contexts, do you have a sense of the total number of bins or the, the total groups, let's say? Yeah. Is that is that defined already? Uh, no, so that's uh, not defined. So in in any like um, for instance, gut micro uh, biome sample, you may have a hundred species in some individuals. Maybe in my gut there's a hundred right now, and in your there's maybe two hundred. So you're not fixing the bins. No, you're not exactly. Fixing the number of groups. You're also yeah. trying to infer that. Uh, yes, I mean, and that actually comes after. So in, in okay. our uh, clustering step, I actually didn't include it, but I have it as an extra slide so I can. Maybe show you to later or something. Because, yeah. Great. Um, uh, okay, because I think that's actually like a, a completely different thing. Because if you want to then cluster such a huge matrix, you can't do all this at all. So we had to come up with some other tricks as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, what we had here is that we had our uh, VAE. Um, and then we basically just very naively, or we tried a couple of different things, but basically very naively, we tried then just to see, okay, what happens if we just input the, the uh, two, um, two data sets into the network, the net, it will then pass the um, data uh, or pass the information um, all the way uh, to, the, um, to the end here, to the uh, re reconstruction. And then basically we would just place, like we would just like impose on the model that, um, that uh, we, it would have to reconstruct the 
abundance data uh, as one output, and it would also have to reconstruct the sequence data uh, as another output. And then we use different losses because the data are different. And finally, we had like also, as I mentioned before, we had this loss here on the latent representation. We also had to kind of find out, okay, what, um, uh, what, what's a good measure of that? And then when we have trained it, then we basically at the end, we have a trained model. We feed our um, um, data into the model. And then we basically, here we then take out the latent representation. So instead of having two uh, representation or two types of data for each context, we then only have one. And that's then this uh, in integrated uh, representation. And this one we could then cluster. Um, and hopefully we will get like uh, hundreds or maybe even thousands of um, uh, bacterial genomes out. And what I want to show you here is that, did it work? Okay. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit about what the loss function intuitively is trying to do? Yes, okay. So basically the loss function is like, how do we optimize the network how do we let the network learn right so basically what we are um, doing here so these so the first two terms here at, um, of the loss function is basically so the first one is the cost entropy so of the abundance so how well does it uh, uh, the uh, reconstruction fit the uh, um, the input um, and then the second part here is then the um, sum of sum of uh, sum of squared errors on the um, DNA um, sequence patterns part. <clears throat> so, and we also, I mean, so I didn't actually put it here, but we also scale them so because they are on different scales. So we kind of have to make sure that, that one of them doesn't like, take over the other one. And I actually only put in the scale here on the Kubrick uh, uh, library divergence. So, con so here on the distribution here, because, um, <clears throat> so, um, because we actually, and we had to downgrade that a lot because we don't, we want it to like uh, be forced to follow this, uh, like we want to kind of constrain the uh, latent space, but we don't want to constrain it too much because then it, it's um, hard for it to, uh, to learn. Did, did that answer your question? Okay, right. Yeah. A related question. So where does the prior come from and how do you decide what the prior ought to be? Yeah. So the, so in basically in, this, in the vanilla setup of the uh, variation autoencoder, the prior is just like a standard Gaussian. So, and that's basically just what we use. So it, it basically enforces like, like a sphere, right? So that the, 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 you kind of have um, spheres, like a sphere in, in the space. So like you, I will always try to think of this as like, a, um, like in a 3D space and you kind of have these millions of points, right? You kind of imagine that you have like, uh, context from one organism down here in this space, you have context from another organism that, uh, over here in this space. So they're kind of like, um, yeah. It, it pulls everything toward the origin, right? It's, the physics analogy is that it's a potential well, it's just a, and the, the Gaussians is the quadratic potential. So. Okay. Do, uh, do you have air wise uh, uh, information here? So do you know that a given point in the red uh, data set and blue correspond to the same exactly. individual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so then don't you have two representations in the latent space? Uh, yeah, so we actually have like, so you're right, we actually have like, here we have two, like one. Oh, I mean, okay, so we actually only have one representation. So that's, I think is the, um, uh, the goal here is that instead of having, as you say, you have a red and a blue um, data set on the same input, then we actually combine that, we let the network learn that, right? And combine that into one representation that then contains the um, information from both. I, I got you. So the, uh, the, the internal networks are shared. Uh, yeah. They're, okay, I got <laughs> Okay, so then, I mean, did, does it actually work? I mean, can it actually integrate these uh, data? And so this is what I show here, and maybe it's a little bit too small, but basically we asked, so of this, we asked two questions here. So each, uh, each uh, like part is a different data set. We had um, uh, six different data sets where we uh, know the truth. And the y-axis is then the number of strains that we 
identify, so higher is better, and x axis is then the, uh, the recall of each of these. So the further up to the top right corner is better. So first we can look at whether um, encoding the data improves the results. And that's basically the dotted lines versus the full lines. And clearly you can see here that encoding enhances the clustering of the data. <clears throat> and second, we can look at the colors here of the uh, full lines where the, 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 these two here, the, the red and the purple one, they are using individual data sets. And then the um, teal one here, or the green one here, that's the uh, using the uh, Lays of representation where they have been combined. So what we can see here is that yes, it actually worked. Right, the network can actually learn to integrate these two um, types of data into something that we can actually use. We then I, then we did a lot more work on this, and then basically ended up um, uh, here like um, comparing to uh, the different or to um, um, uh, the State of the art um, at that time, and we and our, using our method, we were actually up to one hundred percent better compared to the other approaches simply by doing this integration. Also, because we ha also did some other tricks that uh, I, I I don't have time to go into, and I think I'll skip the other one uh, on the side. What we've done now is we also try to exchange this. So you have this variation autoencoder which worked in the way that I just mentioned, but you, there's also other types of autoencoders. Here we did an adversarial one, which works in a different way. It's a lot more com uh, complicated, it's a little bit harder to train. And basically by doing that, we actually found it has almost the same uh, performance as using the VAE. So we were kind of a little bit sad because we had, we hoped that it would be better. But what it turns out is, uh, or what um, it turns out to be is that using the VAE, it, learned, it tends to learn some part of the space of the data and using the AAE, uh, it learns another part of the space. So if we combine the results, then we are actually even better. So this was also kind of, a, I think, a very cool finding. Do, do you have any intuition for the kinds of structure that the one learns versus the other? Uh, I mean, so the uh, adversarial autocode is actually like, um, so uh, the setup of that one is quite different uh, because we actually have like two different latent states. The one that in, in tries to encode a, a, a categorical distribution and one that encodes the uh, continuous distribution. And then we had to kind of, uh, and then we could see, okay, the categorical one learns some type of the data and the uh, continuous learns. Okay, so this first part here, uh, then, I mean, so what I want to kind of, uh, uh, what's the um, take home message from this is that we, we can, Really see here that we can use the VAE to um, integrate uh, the data without a predetermined model. But could we use this for some more data? And I don't know if, how I am on time, if I'm kind of... Uh, Sorry, what, um, yeah, you can go almost till the hour. Um, what was TNF, quick question? Okay, so yeah, that's the tetranucleotide frequency. So that's like uh, basically the, uh, how we measure the DNA sequence diversity. But basically, yeah. it didn't go into detail. You, yeah, you chose tech, you chose four. And yeah, yeah, exactly. sure. Yeah, yeah, and we also benchmark using all the other kinds, uh, like three or two or five, and four was like a good. Uh, yeah, this kind of compromise between resolution and the blow up of the space. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and I, I understand that uh, better is better, but what exactly was the metric uh, that you we were? Okay, uh, yeah. So that was basically how many. So from a data set how many uh, bacterial, high quality bacterial genomes could you get out of it? Yeah. Okay, so what, when we had kind of um, done this, like uh, gotten this understanding that we could use it to integrate data, one of my other uh, PC students also was working uh, in another topic, which is these uh, uh, mental disorders, where we had a, a quite big data set um, of um, individuals with the depression. So, almost uh, 16,000 with depression and almost 4,000 with schizophrenia. Then also like a sample um, uh, background or random uh, background control also from the Danish population. And what we had here is that you had all these different kinds of data, right? So we had uh, the genetics data, which is basically where I came from, but we also had like information about the family. So what 
kind of other kinds of diagnoses have the, these individuals been um, diagnosed with. We had information about um, uh, their birth uh, data. We had what other diagnoses um, did they have? How severe had their, their hospitalization been? And also whether they had other um, uh, medical conditions. And this, I think, <clears throat> so one of the, uh, and here we worked together with the um, MD from, um, from the uh, university um, hospitals in Copenhagen. And basically like, whenever they uh, get a new, whenever they have these patients and they get a new patient and the patient get a diagnosis, they're very like, so what's, what's gonna happen to me? What's the impact on me, right? And these, this is basically something that we wanted to see, okay, could we somehow try to actually um, um, use our models to uh, look a little bit into that? So <clears throat> the overall plan here was then to try to see, okay, could we integrate these, data here with the VAE. Um, then we would use the latent space here to cluster the latent space into various uh, groups, just actually just as we did before, before we clustered the, um, the uh, into uh, bacterial genomes. Here we would just cluster them into patient groups. Um, and finally, we would then train like a standard people neural network to try to see could we then actually predict uh, the outcome of this patient. So here we had a lot of um, we had a lot of different data. Um, so and and one of the major differences here is that we have both had uh, continuous and also uh, categorical data, which we also have to figure out can we actually integrate that using these um, these uh, models. And um, um, again, we use then different. Each of the different data sets had different, uh, were like different parts of the loss function, uh, and also using different types of loss. Um, and then the um, clustering was then do, done using um, uh, k, k means um, clustering of the latent space. <clears throat> and <clears throat> before I show you like some of the results here for this, I also want to go a little bit into the model selection part, which I didn't talk about for the first uh, paper here, <clears throat> uh, but basically we have to figure out, so whatever we have our model, we have our data, we have to figure out what should the architecture of the model be, what should, what's the size of, what's the like the number of layers in the network, what's the uh, no, number of neurons in each layer and so on. Um, <clears throat> we also have to figure out like, what's the, um, how much should we scale this Kubrick Leibach divergence, this thing that constrains the latent space? Uh, and in this case, do you mean the relative weight of the, that penalty versus the, the regular loss? Yes. Okay. Um, and also in this case, because we wanted to do clustering and also using k means and not using the other method that I, um, I uh, unfortunately didn't um, talk about. But basically, um, <clears throat> Uh, so these are all these kind of uh, hyperparameters we need to figure out, right? So <clears throat> what we were doing here is that we were uh, using, um, the, of course, the accuracy of the reconstruction. So how accurate, how good is it at reconstructing the data uh, at this time? How stable was the latent space? So imagine we, we take uh, like an architecture, we train it, um, <clears throat> and then we, um, uh, and then afterwards we, uh, we train it again, then we can see how much does the individual uh, move around in the latent space between round one and round two. The difference being the random initial weights or the stochastic gradient descent. I, mean, I know, yeah, so. What's so, the difference between the runs? Yeah, so the, uh, the difference between the runs will basically just be like um, the architecture. So like how many layers and all like how, Oh, just across, sorry, not it, across yeah, runs, yeah. across architecture. Yeah, not yeah, across training. Yeah. Okay. And of course, we also want to look at how does the cluster system separate after all, uh, as well, right? So to kind of make sure we get something that's robust. Um, and I will not go into the detail here, but basically just say that for an example here. So for this case here, we ended up having two of these hidden layers, so two of these layers in between the input and the latent space of each 800 neurons and then one latent space of the 
Uh, just a, yeah. I guess, a clarification on the point about stability. Um, do you mean stability with this respect, the same architecture or across different values of yeah, uh, so, hyperparameters? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, very good question. So it's uh, within the same architecture. So like if we train the model again, is it then like right. uh, varying a lot where it puts uh, the individuals in this latent space, right? Because if it's doing that, we can't really trust it, right? Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. But did you find um, that different, like I'd be very interested to know like how uh, the architecture choice affected the stability. Do, do you have any kind of general? Uh, I think it's actually very dependent on the data set. I mean, and we, um, so we kind of made this uh, pipeline to do that. So I don't really have any general uh, re recommendations, not to like not, well, the general thing could be not too uh, deep in that part. Right. But then it kind of overfits, you know, it kind of like tries to do all kinds of things that just makes it, I think, too uh, complicated and then it doesn't really um, work as well. Yeah. And then just on the same point, uh, the space is like arbitrarily rotated and has a lot of uh, other possibilities. So, what kind of stability would you look for? Like that, the clusters identities. Yeah, so, so we both look for the cluster. So, like, yeah, uh, do they cluster in the same or do the individual cluster together in the same cluster? And for the latent space ability, how, what was the distance between two in individuals in this space? And we just, uh, I think this was just a, a, a Euclidean distance. Okay, then I want to show you some results. So, we could actually do this. Um, and uh, so basically, first we tried to just take the entire data set, both the individuals that were uh, background controls of uh, random um, back, uh, background, and then also the ones that uh, had the depression and, and uh, schizophrenia. And basically, so this is down here, we have, we have uh, six different clusters here. So, um, and um, um, these, are, these in, with the blue one, these are all like the, controls or all the random uh, background here. And you see that uh, there's actually one group of them that seems to have a quite uh, high load of various of these various uh, input features. So here, this, here I show like the uh, family um, history. So here in, in, inside the uh, map here, so blue means that you have very lower uh, uh, relative amount of this and relative to have more. Um, and we also find two different clusters here of like, uh, MDD. So of the present one that is more severe than the other. But what we actually really wanted to do was actually to kind of mimic like, um, um, like when, so if I go to the, to, the, to the doctor and I get diagnosed with one of these um, uh, diseases or uh, disorders, then um, what is then my potential outcome, right? So then we, so we basically, okay, uh, we basically divided or we only looked at the ones that were, had um, uh, a disorder here and you probably can't see it, but I can, uh, so basically here we uh, divide, here was, we found seven different clusters, um, all the various uh, comorbidities and um, the uh, strengths of the, uh, disorder. And for instance, um, you see here, like this is just one of them I picked out. So this is cluster five of the depression. They have uh, a higher incidence of behavioral disorders. They have um, uh, more housing days, so they are more admitted to the hospital. They have more suicide attempts and so on. So this actually means that what we can do here is we can stratify these individuals into what actually seems to be quite or into. Uh, into meaningful clinical clusters, it's something you could actually, that would actually be nice to know when I get diagnosed. So what is, um, what is, the, um, what is my future in a sense? And we then built like, so we then took these clusters and then we removed all the data before, but like, well, that is after the diagnosis. So we only have the uh, information if, uh, on, up until when you get the diagnosis. We try to build just the standard uh, neural network to see could we then actually predict these clusters from the data that we have at the time of the diagnosis. And it actually works quite well here, for instance, for the 
uh, for the uh, schizophrenia subgroups. Um, here we, um, we, we were able to, what we had like um, seven different groups here, and some of them we can actually predict up to 0 0.86 uh, AFT. So this would actually inform on like the uh, uh, potential uh, treatment and also uh, uh, severity of the disease, of the disorder. And what was actually quite interesting is that to look at what is the model then actually trying to or using to to, uh, um, to make this prediction, we see that it's actually both using information that we had from the registry or that we had from the hospitals, but actually also uh, genetics data was actually also quite important. It was also the same thing for the other diseases. So <clears throat> here for part two, what I told you is then um, there's some information or we learned something about the mental disorders. I think I'll skip it for now in the interest of time. And then instead say, okay, we learned that we can integrate these uh, data here um, and both across uh, uh, continuous and pedagogical data. And this then leads on to part number three, where, so yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um. Can you comment on how you chose the uh, the types of data from the beginning that went into the model? Was that guided by like a clinician? Um, and then the second thing is now that you've seen sort of the important scores for the different inputs, yeah. does that kind of give you any hints about what else you could collect that would improve your predictions? Uh, that's a very good question. I actually, so the data that came into it, that was basically, um, I think that's a really good question because it's really, it was kind of directed by the uh, medical doctor. Um, and so in Denmark, we have these registries where basically have information about everyone in Denmark. Um, so basically, so, so, um, so this was like all the information that he deemed to be relevant, right? So of course, I think there could be other information as well that could also be um, relevant to include. Um, and whether that would, there's like, uh, it could tell us something about what other uh, stuff uh, that we could include. I'm actually not 100% uh, sure. I think that it's probably um, uh, the medical doctors. I think he, he's more into that, but I probably can't answer. Okay, yeah. What kind of uh, sample numbers do you think you need to be able to effectively train these? Because if you look at only the molecular types, it's not easy to get more than a few thousand. Yeah. But for other uh, electronic health records, you can get probably tens of thousands or millions. So yeah. where do you draw the line? I think, so here we had like uh, 40,000 total, right? Uh, yeah, so here we had uh, 40,000. Yeah, but I think you could, um, I think, the more the better, but I think you could easily do with less. Uh, but we are involved in these uh, electronic health record uh, projects where we have so where we have um, uh, information for around 2.8 million people. So I think that would be super fun, super interesting as well to look at. Uh, just to jump on Boris' question previously, so in a standard predictive model if you were to include a variable and it has no information of predictive value, the model can avoid using it entirely. But as a VAE with reconstruction as a requirement, including an extraneous variable will change the pairwise distance structure in the latent space in a way that's potentially not helpful to your clustering similarities thing. So did you think about like uh, removing some of the uh, less helpful information? Uh, that's a super good point. I think we, we didn't actually do that. I mean, so we removed information that didn't vary uh, at all. I mean, because there's no in information in that. But we didn't actually remove um, features that could somehow confound it. Um, so I think that that's a very good comment. Okay, so then I wanna spend a little bit of time um, obviously the last time on this last part here, where we basically uh, try to take it a step further because what we had done before was we saw that we could integrate it and we could like also use the latent space. But we still felt, so we felt like we actually didn't really know what it was doing. So we didn't actually know what was it actually learning, right? You can see where the individuals are in the latent space. So what is it actually doing? And this is something we try to tackle here. And so this is a data set. I mean, also as you pointed out, I mean, 
um, so where the, uh, the previous data set was kind of not very wide, this is this is uh, uh, like this multi omics data where we only have for 800 individuals, right? But there we have genetics, uh, transcriptomics, photomics, metabolomics, gut microbiome. We have a lot of clinical phenotypes on them, so MRI scanning, uh, uh, med medication history. Uh, we have also a lot of in environmental data. So we have all this kind of data, right? Basically did the same thing as we did before, um, try to integrate it. But what we wanted to know here was, what did it learn? How did it, um, because if it learned to integrate it, it must have learned the rules, right? I mean, because you can't integrate it without learning which features are dependent on other features. So um, that's basically what we wanted to try. And here we wanted to focus on the drugs because there's like, Many drugs we don't know the mode of action of. So if you could somehow um, look at the how the drugs influence the omic um, <clears throat> we came up with this uh, model here. Um, we also just recently published. Basically, um, all of this here is basically the same as I just shown in the previous example. Whereas what we have here on the side or here on the, in the red box, that's then what basically what we add. And this, these are these, what we call um, virtual perturbations. So we actually, so we, where we train the model and then we, after we've trained it, we then actually try to perturb some of the input data to see what's the effect. Uh, and and in, uh, in, in this case, we then use the, the drugs. So, but before we go to that, I just wanted to show here, okay, we can actually learn all this data. So this is uh, uh, the uh, reconstruction accuracies here. So here, higher is better for all of the different data sets. We can actually learn them. We can also look at the latent space as we did before. So this is a UMAP representation of the latent space of all these individuals. Each individual is a dot. Um, and here they are colored according to the tool index, which basically tells about uh, interesting uh, uh, sensitivity. Um, and basically, we see here, and maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's like an overrepresentation of individuals with low insulin sensitivity here, and here down here, there's an overrepresentation of the individ individuals with high insulin sensitivity. If we just did, uh, try to do the same thing with the raw data, PCAs, UMAT, sparse PCAs, all kind of other methods, doesn't find anything, or it doesn't find any of these uh, uh, clinical profiles. So basically, what we can say here is that it seems that we can actually uh, learn these uh, clinical um, profiles. We also show that it actually is not affected by missing data, which is a big problem normally. And we also show that it's actually um, robust to uh, various uh, uh, confounders, such as age and sex, and where you were living, uh, or uh, which uh, country you're from, and so on. But so this was fine. This is similar to what we had shown before. But we wanted to have like dig into these. What did it learn, right? How could we then actually? Uh, how could we extract that information? And so what we uh, came up with here was to look at uh, here. Here you have the auto encoder here, and and what actually is the case is that this last part here, which is in the blue part, this is actually able to generate new data. So this is like uh, so uh, we also call it a generative model because you can learn the distribution of your data and you can then use it to generate new data. And so could we somehow use that to kind of tease out uh, what it would actually learn? And what we ended up doing was actually quite simple. So what we asked is here is like, what happens? So first we train the model. Then we ask what happens if we, if I change this feature here, right? So I change the, this input uh, value, what then happens to all the, uh, uh, all the re reconstructions out here or the other thing? Um, so kind of like um, what we were then doing here is then because we were interested in drugs and this is like quite easy because either you get the drug or you don't get the drug. Like, so also, you can also look, uh, go into doses and so on. We didn't do that. Um, um, but basically, so then it's actually quite easy, right? Because you can then take all the patients that are not administered this drug, and you can then change them from zero to one. And then you can see what's the effect um, on the other features. 
question. Um, do you have any, you know, small set of very valuable ground truth gold standard data where you were able to test how well this works? I think this is a major weakness here that we actually don't have that, right? Because we, we, we actually, yeah, you don't have the counterfactual, but do you have anything that's kind of like a proxy for that where you yeah, have so, a patient that was given the drug you know, data from before and after? Or? No, no I mean, yeah, we actually also don't have that. Okay. So we, uh, we were able, so we had to uh, generate some uh, simulated data and some randomized data uh, to show that we can actually do this. And then we basically used the literature, and I have a couple of examples ah. to kind of show that what we find is actually real. Like biologically meaningful. Exactly. Medic, biomedically meaningful. Yeah. Okay. So, but again, this was actually like not very um, easy to do. It took a lot of time to figure out how to actually do this properly. And the next speaker, Ricardo from my group would actually like dive into that. So I will not dive into it. Um, but basically I could just say we have, we basically did some kind of, we had to train the model many times to be sure that what's actually doing is correct. So we kind of uh, generating an estimate of the distribution that we are trying to compare. And then we did two various methods to try to see what's actually a significant, on top of that, what's actually a, a significant drug omics uh, uh, association. <clears throat> so during this, uh, on the real data, I skipped all the kind of the stuff where we kind of validated and so on. Um, but doing this on the real data, you can show that if you compare this to like uh, using standard uh, approaches, we can here for uh, here we, these are all the uh, the drugs that are given to uh, the individuals in the cohort of more than uh, twenty different drugs. Um, we show we can actually find additional uh, many more additional uh, significant associations. Um, we can go in and look at them. I mean, um, so here this is an example here, um, similar to what I showed before. But here we just down here we have uh, the drugs. Uh, and here we have all the, uh, uh, or some of the uh, clinical measurements. And what we can see, or what we can then show here is that, uh, for instance, here for metformin is that it's, so uh, metformin is like uh, a drug used to lower the uh, glucose uh, uh, levels in your blood. It's like very well, or very much used within, how to treat uh, type two diabetes. And what we found here was that it was actually associated with, uh, uh, your mean glucose levels and also glucose uh, sen sensitivity. So this was cool. But we actually found that it was um, that the model thought it was in the opposite way. So the model had uh, had learned had learned that actually, so giving metformin to the patients or to the individuals will actually increase your mean uh, mean glucose, but it actually does the opposite. And this is where these kind of electronic health records, all these kind of um, things come in because or where it, it gets kind of interesting because this is actually um, completely due to uh, confounding by indication. Because the, the reason why the doctors are giving the, this patient this drug is exactly the um, amount of glucose in the blood. So basically all the individuals that have high glucose, they are then actually, I mean, the model actually learns the doctor's decision in this example. So you really have to be careful when we kind of start um, uh, working with these kind of data. But there was also, I mean, we also see here that there are for some way it makes sense. These are the statins here. Uh, statins are used to treat uh, high cholesterol. And you see that they are associated with like uh, a decrease in fasting uh, LDL and uh, uh, cholesterol in the blood. It makes perfect sense. This is what they were, they are designed to do. You also see that they have opposite effects on HDL. And this is actually also known from the literature. So the model can actually tease out that they actually work in a different way. I think that's pretty cool. We, of course, go through, I mean, all the different kinds of data and, 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 and look at what's known and what's not known. I will not do that here. I think I will skip this one as well. Um, and then just say that, I mean, we can, of course, look at the individual associations, but we can also look at the impact a drug has on a data set, right? So, um, you can look at so what's so how large a fraction of the features in a data set is actually associated with, um, with artificially giving a drug to this patient. We can look at what's the estimated effect size of a drug across the different omics data sets. And we can, of course, also look at what's the overall impact 
using a dot across all the image data. And this can also tell us various things. So <clears throat> what we basically learned here, and I think Ricardo will kind of um, so uh, I'll go more into detail with it uh, in his talk. But basically we can use this generative process using these perturbations to investigate the system. Uh, we used it to identify these cross-nodal associations. Um, and, and we kind of think of this a little bit of this like um, Gedanken experiment, which is like a German word for thought experiment, which is like very, uh, I mean, which is very, um, uh, it's, famous uh, way of thinking that Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr did where they were doing the, uh, some of their big uh, discoveries, right? So they couldn't do the actual experiment, but they could do it in their mind. And this is basically this a little bit the same, right? I mean, what we're actually doing here is actually, actually enabling to learn the data and then ask different questions of it, ask different, uh, or do different experiments in the kind of, in our minds, but just in the model. Have a um, yeah, so in that in that trouble troubling example with the metformin, um, I, I didn't quite catch the conclusion. So were you able to control for that by including additional EMR information or you just don't? So yeah. do you have any sense of how to catch stuff like that or in yeah. general? I mean, that's that that's very challenging, right? I think that really depends on the data set, right? Or on the cohort. So this was basically just like a, a, a cross-sectional uh, cohort. So you basically just have one time point. Right, so we can't really, uh, and we, and they were also all um, newly diagnosed individuals, right? So okay, we basically couldn't really tell, like, okay, um, uh, or we couldn't tease, uh, like, take it out of the model. I mean, maybe that's a way of doing it. Right, we would be. Do you have okay? And then, so then, with longitudinal data, one imagines that you could do better. Yeah, exactly. but you would need to structurally incorporate that into your learning. That the fact that it is longitudinal. Right? Exactly. Yeah, that's something we also work. You're working on cool. Yeah. So, with these like uh, uh, thought experiments, these like a um experiment, what we basically can use them for is this uh, hypothesis generation, right? So we can, uh, I mean, our model on the tries to understand the entire system. Then we can ask uh, things of it. We asked about the block, but you could actually ask a lot of other questions as well. And finally, I mean. What this also enables us to do, imagine we have like many thousands of patients, hundreds of thousands. Then we can actually learn from all these patients. Um, and then we can, like, whenever you come with a new patient, you can actually estimate what's the effect of giving a drug or doing some intervention in this patient, right? And versus doing another intervention. And I think this is really cool. And I think something that, I mean, at least to me, is like beyond like these kind of other ideas, which is like patient like me, digital twin, you kind of try to see, okay, is there someone that looks like, me, right? And then you use that information. But we are actually just like these big uh, generative models. We're basically in, by doing it like this, we're actually using all the data, right? Not just this individual to say something about what will happen to me if I'm treated with a certain intervention, but we're actually using in, in information across uh, the entire system. I think that's very cool. So that was basically my talk. My conclusions here um, is that, okay, we can integrate data without a predefined model. We can integrate multimodal data, various types of data. We can do analysis of the latent representation. And we can use this to kind of do this kind of cross-modal uh, identification and also these uh, thought And I think uh, there's a lot of people I need to acknowledge. So um, for the, uh, for my group here. So for the first part, uh, Jacob and Joachim, who did a lot of the work, how that worked on the adversarial autoencoder and Ole uh, Winter, who was the, who was the um, professor that actually got me into all these uh, VAE distance in the beginning. For the mental disorder part, uh, Michael Benros, uh, Rosa, who did a lot of the work, the uh, eyesight consortium. And then here for the last part, Sam Brunak, uh, my boss, and uh, also Ricardo and Mark as well, and also the uh, direct consortium, and um, funding from the Novo Nordisk Foundation and Lundberg Foundation. The uh, Tapu Diabetes was funded by um, various uh, European Union uh, funds. And um, you can catch me on email and on.
Well, hello, everybody. And today I will go into detail on our MOOP pipeline, that is uh, multi-omics variational autoencoders that was presented earlier by uh, Simon. And I'll start by, uh, yes, by giving you an overview of the topics that I will be covering during this talk, uh, which will be roughly divided into four sections. So first I will talk a bit about the, our data and the processing that is going through. Then I'll dive into the uh, VE model, the version of the encoder model that we're using. And after that, I'll talk about the method that we use to identify associations. So these uh, thought experiments that uh, Simon talked about earlier. And lastly, I will talk about the latest improvements and for the work, for the work that we have planned for this project. So let's start uh, with our data and its preprocessing. For developing our move, uh, we work with the direct data set. So this data set is um, a data set that has clinical, molecular, and environmental data for around 700 newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients. And some of the data types that you can find in this data set are, for instance, most of the omics. So we have proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, uh, genomics, also uh, gut microbiome, so metagenomics. And we also have some of the uh, clinical information about the patients. So the medication history, their diabetes history, uh, blood measurements uh, like sugar, et cetera. And finally, we also have information about the patient's environment. So their diet, their physical activity, their smoking, drinking, and sleeping patterns. And all these data uh, we can classify into either categorical or continuous data. For categorical, we have, for instance, uh, what drugs the patients are taking. Uh, so either they are on this treatment or not on this treat, on another treatment. Um, also the genomics, so whether they have a SNP or they don't have it. And for the continuous data, then we have all the other measurements. So the measurements that are coming from the blood, from the proteome, from the transcriptome, metabolome, from the uh, microbiome, et cetera. And we will then pre-process each of these two data types uh, differently. So for the categorical data, we're going to do what is called a one-hot encoding, which is basically just transforming our data from this wide format uh, table into a long uh, or wide format uh, table. Um, so for instance, we can see here that um, we have four patients, each one on taking different kinds of drugs, and we just express the same information in a longer format. So then we move on to the continuous data, which we will go on, which we will uh, do two transformations on that. We will first use the log transform and then we'll do uh, C-score normalization. And this will make it so our data is uh, coming closer to our normal distribution that is centered around zero and has a standard deviation of around one. So basically our, our raw data looks like this, uh, like the side on the left. And after the transformations, it will have the shape that we can see on the right side. In total, we have integrated over 8,000 uh, continuous variables and 450 categorical, uh, categorical variables, which are present in 700 uh, samples, so 700 patients. And here's a rundown of uh, the different variables that we have. So for instance, we have 393 uh, genomics variables. We're taking into account 20 drugs or 20 different uh, medications. And um, yeah, for the other continuous data sets, we have around 300 uh, proteomic variables, 50 uh, variables describing the diet and the physical activity. And also uh, you can see here the numbers, uh, 6,000 transcript, transcripts, readings uh, for 100, well, 300 in total uh, met metabolites. And we also have the uh, around uh, 1,400 uh, taxa described for each of these patients. And now I will move into uh, how the model uh, is structured, how it works. And just a little disclaimer before I continue, uh, most of this work was developed by uh, Rosa, um, one of the former PhD students in our group, and I'm taking over uh, the project. So I'll start uh, by describing uh, the type of model that we're using, which is the variational autoencoder. And this type of model is uh, characterized by having a bowtie architecture. So it's composed of both an encoder and a decoder network. 
um, that, as Simon has already explained, will take the data and will take the data, um, pass it uh, or transform it into a latent representation, and then reconstruct it. So for the integration, uh, we'll take all our data sets, uh, we'll reshape them and concatenate them into an input matrix that is two dimensional. So in one of the axes, we will have all the features, all the categorical features, all the continuous features, and in the other axis, we'll have a row for each of the samples. And this matrix will be fed into the model, starting with the first part, which is the encoder. So the encoder is in charge of compressing our data into a low dimensional space. Uh, in our case, we go for from around 8,000 uh, variables or 8,000 features to just 1,000, and then we do a further compression until uh, 100 features. So this is the size of our latent space, 100 features um, per sample. Uh, we can see here that we have uh, in our latent space actually um, uh, two blocks, one for, them, one for the mean and one for the standard deviation, and that's because our latent space is described by a, by a Gaussian distribution. Uh, in the next step, uh, we will take this, uh, we will draw from this uh, distribution, and then we'll do the, re the reverse operation, which is basically decompressing our late, uh, yeah, decompressing our late space and reshaping it back into the shape of our, our original data. Um, yes, and once we have uh, both the original data and the reconstruction, we'll train our model by comparing both of these uh, instances uh, through a loss function that is composed of two terms. So we can see here the loss functions. We have on the left side a reconstruction error, on the right side a regularization term. So I'll talk first about the reconstruction error. Um, this is split into two further terms and is calculated by comparing uh, both uh, the categorical section of the data and the continuous section of um, of our both our data sets. So for the categorical section, we'll calculate cross entropy. And for the continuous data, we'll calculate mean square error. So we can see here that, for instance, not all of our data is reconstructed uh, precisely or faithfully. So we'll catch these differences and make it so the model can faithfully uh, restore our data from its latent representation. And additionally, we included a regularization term. This is the so-called uh, kullberg libler divergence. And this will force the latent sp space to match uh, standard normal distribution, which is our prior or what we believe uh, the latent space should look like. And this allows us to draw meaningful uh, samples from, from it. So now that we have uh, an understanding of how our model looks and how we train it with our Excuse objective me. function. Yes, go for it. Hi, excuse me. I was wondering. I'm I'm working on something similar. So, and I'm struggling with the difference uh, uh, in the in the ways that different uh, different types of data may have on the objective function. So, the transcriptomics I saw is like six thousand features, while other yes. types of data are like uh, in the tens or hundreds of features. Don't you have that one kind of data may overwhelm in terms of signal the other kinds of data? Uh, yes, that is a possibility, and uh, for that reason, on uh, on our loss function, we included a weight uh, for the different data data sets. So, if we um, found out that one of them was not reconstructed uh, properly, or that was probably lacking, uh, uh, yeah, attention, we could penalize uh, the other ones or make it so the objective function would put more attention into a specific data set. But, but but so the so the weight are uh, divided in continuous and categorical. But what about the uh, the the distinctions in transcriptomics, uh, metabolomics data, and this kind of distinction? Is there a weight for those two? Yes, uh, yes. So here is a simplification. But uh, each data set has their own weight. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Um, I had a, another quick question yeah. on that. How do you determine the weight a priori? Uh, is there a prior that you set, and what does that prior look like? Uh, so for these weights, um, we basically run uh, different experiments, and then we saw how the reconstruction accuracy of each of the data sets was, and then we adjusted them manually. So yeah, that was basically the process with it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, where did I leave? Uh, yes. 
Um, yeah, so now that we have our model and our objective function, um, we proceed to a tuning process. And uh, this is about uh, a bit what I was just answering. Uh, and in this tuning process, we will select the best set of hyperparameters. And in here, what I define as best is the ones that give us the model that um, creates the low, uh, yeah, has the lowest reconstruction error and has the most stable latent space. And this stability in the latent space is a bit what Simo was talking about. So it's uh, latent spaces that don't uh, differ too much when you draw samples from them. Um, some of the par par hyperparameters that we varied, uh, that we were looking at were the architecture of the BAE. So how deep was the inside network inside the decoder and the encoder, um, the size of the layers, also the size of the latent space, and then the weights that we were putting on the uh, regularization, regularization term, and also the weights of the uh, individual data sets. All right, so our next step is uh, in our pilot is using these models that we have trained uh, to identify associations between our input variables. Uh, so we can use these variational autoencoders, basically ones that they have learned uh, the structure of our data, uh, to ask questions like, what if a patient receives a different treatment than what they had initially received? And how does that change the reconstruction that the, mo that the model uh, generates? So the first step in here is to add a perturbation to our data. Uh, so we'd have a data uh, that looks originally like the one on the left side. And then uh, we would say, okay, the first two patients were not taking paracetamol, but let's think, let's, uh, yeah, let's see what happens if we uh, give them that drug. And then we would repeat this process for all the other drugs. So we here also have codeine, but in our case, we had 20 different drugs uh, that we tested. Um, the next step is that we train our model on the original unperturbed data. So the data just as we had it. And once we have this model, we will pass both the original data and the perturbed data to this model, and we will obtain two reconstructions. Uh, so here we can see we have reconstruction A from, from the original data and reconstruction B generated from the uh, data that was perturbated. And because the BA models are stochastic, so they don't always give us the same result, we use an ensemble of uh, BAs uh, to increase our certainty. So we repeat this training process multiple times. In our case, we, re we repeated it uh, 10 times, but this is something that we benchmarked by repeating over, I think uh, we did several tests with five repetitions, 10 repetitions, 20 repetitions, 30 repetitions, and um, set the yeah set the threshold of how many, what was the minimum repetitions that we needed uh, in order to have um, uh, trust, uh, yeah, uh, trustworthy results. Um, and the next step, once that we have- Hi, uh, I have a question. Yes. Do you know if these converge at all? Do you know that if there's an ideal number, is there an ideal in here? Or are you just sort of um, using uh, your intuition? Um, yes, so this, we ran several tests with different ends. Uh, yeah, with different number of repetitions. And we used also a simulated data set, which we had like, let's say the answers to, or we knew what were the associations that we were looking at or that we would, wanted to find. And this is how we define uh, what our end would be. Uh, could I ask another question there? Uh, training sure. B training BAEs is a stochastic process, but also BAEs have randomness inside of them, right? Because of the sampling uh, in the decoder step. So uh, where does that ladder randomness come in in this? Um, you mean on the sampling of the VA? Yeah, so if you were to just uh, run the perturbed data twice, you would get two different reconstructions because of two different sigmas sampled. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I will uh, talk a bit more about this on the next slides. Yeah, uh, okay, so I'll continue. So our next steps, uh, yeah, one, once we repeat this process several times is to check if this, the reconstructions are significantly different. And we do this through two approaches. One is to t-testing and the other one is Bayesian decision theory. And this is what I will dive into uh, for the next slides. Um, so the first approach, the t-test approach, um, I'll just roll back a bit so I can go more into detail in the process. So we have two sets of data. 
original and perturbed, uh, perturbed data. Uh, we start by passing the first set uh, through the model several times, and we'll take the first um, reconstruction that comes out of this as the baseline reconstruction. And then we'll use this baseline reconstruction to calculate a baseline difference by subtracting each one of the subsequent uh, reconstructions to, the, to this baseline. Then we'll do a similar process with the perturb uh, data. So we'll pass the perturb data to the model. Uh, we'll obtain a perturb reconstruction, and then we'll uh, subtract it to the baseline reconstruction to obtain a perturbation difference. This will make us have two groups of reconstruction differences. We have a group of baseline differences, and we have a group of perturbation differences. And we will use a pair t test to compare if they are different, uh, group A from group A from group B. And to increase identity uh, even furthermore, uh, we repeated the process uh, for different architectures, so for different models, in which we just basically change the size of the latent space. Um, so we go from original data to train model, we obtain a baseline difference. Uh, this is by repeating several times. Then we do from perturbed data to train model, we obtain a perturbation difference. We compare these two through a t-test and we obtain a set of p-values. And as I say here, we repeat this uh, several times and then we repeated it also for four different architectures. Uh, once we corrected the p-values uh, for multiple tests, we used uh, the born ferroni correction. We are going to assess whether the perturbation signific significantly changes uh, the reconstruction of the, the, that the model generates using the following uh, logic. So first, we take our correct p-values for one feature, and we see if either if half of them are significant uh, for the number of results of refits or like times that we retrain the model. If that is true, then we check if three out of four, um, if they're significant in three out of four of the different models or architectures that we, um, that we tested. And if that is also true, then we conclude that they are significant. And that means that there is an association between the variable that we perturb. So for instance, we change the drugs. So let's say that paracetamol and then a particular feature. And this feature can be any of the features that are in the continuous data sets uh, in our input data. So this is one of the ways uh, on which, which we tested whether the feature, the um, associations were significant, but then we also devised uh, another method. And this one is based on the uh, Bayesian decision theory. Bayesian decision theory. Uh, in which we decide between two cases. Uh, here we have a hypothesis that is our feature uh, X. So let's say a feature from the proteomic set, uh, data set is associated with a drug. And then we have the alternative hypothesis that this feature is actually not associated with a drug. And by calculating a ratio between the probability of this hypothesis, we can obtain a so-called uh, base factor which tell us, uh, depending on its magnitude, which of the hypotheses we would need, or we would uh, favor, or which one of these we're more certain of. And to calculate uh, these probabilities, what we did is that first we computed uh, the difference between the reconstructions. And this is as easy as just uh, doing a subtraction between the original and the perturbed reconstruction. Uh, here I have represented in these histograms uh, the reconstruction differences by doing this operation for all the um, samples that we have, but also for all the repetitions that we, um, that, that we train the model. Uh, and um, we then calculate the probability that this reconstruction difference is uh, greater than zero, which is the... Uh, the part of the plots with the, with the lines here. And here we also have uh, three different cases. So if the reconstruction difference is, let's say, uh, equal to zero, we believe that it's equal to zero, then this probability will be around uh, 0.5. So 50% of the samples will be equally split between greater than zero and less than zero. If the changing or the perturbation of the variable that we uh, tested. So for instance, one of the drugs changed the, uh, the values of the reconstruction on the negative side, so it decreased the values of the reconstruction, then this uh, probability will be um, less than 0.5, so it will be like a, a really small probability that is greater than zero. 
And if it's the other case uh, that the perturbation introduces a positive change in the reconstruction, then we'll see probabilities that are greater than zero. So then we take these probabilities and uh, we can obtain the base factor that I mentioned earlier. And uh, we can already tell the magnitude uh, of, this, of these base factors can help us uh, sort which will be uh, probably significant associations and which, which are unlikely associations between uh, the variables that we are perturbating and the other variables in our data. So now we rank our features or we sort them um, in descending order by the base factor. So first we have the one with the ones, here's a feature N that had the greatest base factor and up to the last one, which is feature one that uh, we believe that doesn't have a, or didn't change uh, much after the perturbation. So uh, in the first positions, we'll have the features with these um, putative uh, associations and in the later positions, then we'll have the ones where the reconstruction difference was equal to zero or basically they have no associations. And uh, we need one way to define, uh, so where to draw the line. So when do we say, okay, uh, yeah, this one is uh, significant, but this one is not, or are all of them significant? So we have to define a threshold or way to decide, and it can be either here or here, depending on our size uh, of our data set. So what we did is that we um, calculated a false discovery rate or a false prediction rate based on the cumulative cumulative evidence that we have of uh, association being not significant. So on our phase uh, hypothesis. Uh, so then we plot this uh, FDR and then we define a significance level. So let's say we just wanted to find no more than 5% of the associations being, um, being uh, fastly classified. So we selected this uh, threshold and we take then the associations that are below this threshold. So in this example, uh, we set the threshold at, the threshold at uh, 5%. So that means that we'll take around these uh, 40 associations as significant. So we can select, uh, yeah, as an example, these two associations as significant. And then we say that the other, the other last one was not significant. Um, Yes, so this concludes how we selected, uh, how we identified associations or we classify them as either um, significant or not. And now I'm going to talk about uh, what are our next uh, moves, our next plans for this project. But first I'll do a short recap. So we integrated both categorical and continuous data with MOVE and we have the model there in the structure of the data. And then by using uh, or by doing perturbations to this data, we can assess the changes in the reconstructions that the model generates. And then we can trace whether these uh, associations are significant uh, by two methods, which are either the T-test or this uh, Bayesian decision theory based method. So some of the improvements that we have planned uh, for this pipeline is, uh, so far we can only find associations between binary and uh, Hi, categorical can I, variables. Can I can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, did you benchmark like which the associations, uh, you know, how do the significant so associations compare between uh, this method and for example, looking at correlations or some regression models or, uh, to, to, yes. to extract those associations? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we uh, when we benchmark against uh, standard t-test. So um, a t-test just taking like the data set and checking if there was a yeah a relation between uh, a, yeah between the, the diagnosis and the different features. And and, yeah, and, and then what, uh, yeah. And what kind of, um, you know, how did, is it the same variables that are associated or the different ones that are associated? Like, uh, So we found uh, there was an overlap in uh, features that were associated, but also our method uh, gave us more associations than the standard t-test. Um, so that was one of the, let's say, like one of the strengths of just uh, getting your data and running a t-test through it. So we could find other associations that we would not, not normally find. 
Yeah, I find that really interesting because I guess one alternate interpretation of that is if they're not significant, if when association is significant with your method and not with a t-test, then what? Like, I find it very interesting. Like, how do you interpret that information? So you say there isn't a significant difference, but there is a significant difference with respect to this, I guess, bias, like statistical test bias by representation learning. Um, how? How do you interpret interpret that? So I, I guess in, in so if I if I were to find like a feature that's associated in the model but not in a t test, I would like my first instinct would be to conclude that it's not significant. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think our, our intuition is that there's these uh, associations that are um that have multiple links to other to the other features and that by integrating uh this data that we let the model learn all these different relationships between the different variables that are in the data so that's why it brings uh, more associations that we could normally find just by looking at the data on a one by one uh case uh, yeah one by one by one basis yeah that's super interesting thank you Yep. Um, where was I? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so, so far we can only find associations between our binary and categorical variables. So uh, like we did in the MOOC paper, uh, we were changing the drug status of our, of our samples or our patients. So from basically from zero to one and checking how that, how did the continuous variable responded um, but we're also interested in looking at how changes in continuous variables themselves make or generate other changes in the other continuous variables. So for instance, um, by doing the variation of, let's say, the abundance of one of the organisms in the microbiome, how does that affect the other features, which right now we cannot do. But uh, Mark is working on this and uh, he's present in the room, so uh, feel free to talk to him uh, about this uh, about this uh, development, if you're interested. Um, we also th thought about, well, right now we're using this uh, ensemble of models to trace uh, significant associations, and it's a bit resource intensive because we have to train several models. So is there a better way to assess um, to assess the, the, yeah, the significance of associations? And this is what I will uh, talk a bit more in detail in the last few slides. And one other aspect that we are taking into consideration is how can we integrate time into this, uh, especially for longitudinal studies. So especially for this data set, the data dataset, uh, it's a longitudinal study. So there's like uh, multiple time points uh, that we have all the multi-omic profile of the patients. So we're interested also in looking into this and um, maybe checking the trajectory of these uh, associations uh, a long time. Uh, so back to the, the second point, uh, I'll talk about how we plan to improve the process of identifying significant associations. And for this, we plan on using uh, what is called Bayesian t-testing. Um, and basically Bayesian t-testing is uh, an approach that is more robust than the traditional t-test. It does not require correcting, which was also one of the problems that we have uh, with doing so many tests that were across different types of models, across different uh, repetitions. And it's also more informative about the uncertainty of our conclusions. I'm going to explain how this uh, method works for those that are not familiar with it. But this method relies on describing two different groups uh, or uh, similar groups. That's what we will find out by a t-distribution. Uh, this t-distribution is described by three parameters. So it has a mean and a standard deviation like the normal Gaussian distribution, but it also has a normality parameter that describes or that makes this distribution heavy tailed. So it's suitable for describing uh, data that has outliers. And uh, using uh, Bayesian inference, uh, we estimate the distribution of these parameters. And we do this for each of the groups that we have. Uh, but we also require to define a set of priors uh, or what we believe these parameters, or how will these parameters will be uh, distributed. 
uh, usually the process is that we use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to estimate these parameters. Uh, one of the drawbacks of using Markov Monte Carlo uh, sampling is that it's also a resource intensive uh, process. So it requires quite some time to converge, especially if we are doing uh, comparisons about many features. So for instance, in our case, we had 8,000 uh, features with 20 perturbations. So I ran down the math uh, to do this with Marco Monte Carlo sampling. We would need around uh, 300 years uh, of uh, sampling just to get all the results. Um, still, uh, the next step is once you have the estimation of the parameters, so you have the distribution of the means of the that describe this, the, the first uh, group. In our case, would be the baseline reconstructions, and the second group would be the perturbation reconstructions. We can compare uh, both of them. Uh, specifically, we will uh, take the means from the, the first group and the means from the second group uh, to obtain a difference of means, and we we will uh, define what is called a region of practical equivalence around zero. So that is a set of our interval that we will define, okay, this interval is, uh, whatever is inside this interval is equal to zero. And we would compare our, uh, our different, uh, yeah, difference of means for, let's say, a feature that has not a significant association or a feature that has a significant association and see whether that overlap happens. And that's how we would classify the features now or the associations as significant or not significant. Um, if we look at this from, let's say, from uh, Bear's eye point of view, uh, we can plot their high density interval. So that is where most of the data is lying. And we can see whether this, this interval is uh, overlapping with the region of practical equivalence to zero that we defined earlier. So this basically, uh, we're looking at different features here, or can be also different samples. And we're checking which one of them overlap with this region that we define as zero, and which one of them do not overlap. So how we, we do this uh, with move? So we would have to change first the architecture of our decoder. So right now our decoder is a uh, really simple decoder that basically outputs a reconstruction, but we're planning to change it. So it instead models uh, the parameter distributions uh, of each one of these groups which will save us the, uh, the need to do the Marco Monte Carlo sampling because we would already obtain uh, the, the, yeah, the parameters of the this t distribution which we can compare and we have tested this method with this uh, data set that i think probably everybody knows which is the iris data set it's a really simple data set with 150 samples it also has five features. Uh, one of them is categorical, so the species of the flower, which can be versicolor, setosa, or virginica. And there's four features describing the length and the width of the flower petal and the sepal. So what we did is that we took this uh, data set, we trained our, uh, our new model, the, the, the new architecture that I showed earlier. And we did a perturbation here. So we changed the species. In this case, we changed the species of all flowers to be uh, versicolor. And what we expected is, okay, we'll look at the uh, four different features or four different uh, continuous features that the, that the data set has and see if they are significant. Uh, here I'm plotting each one of the samples. So there's like 150 samples of the, uh, of the data set. Each line represents the uh, the distribution uh, of the difference of the means between the reconstruction uh, of the baseline and the reconstruction of the uh, model that has uh, received the perturbation. And we can see that uh, for the four features, uh, the groups that were not perturbated, so the Virginica and Cetosa groups, uh, seem to be outside this region of practical equivalence that we define, so they can be uh, significant. So our second experiment for this was, okay, let's try it with a data set that has uh, one feature that is not associated to the feature that we are uh, perturbing. So we remove the perturbation of one of the features by shuffling it. 
So we took the beta width, we shuffle all the data points to keep the same distribution of the data, but to remove the association between beta width and species of the flower. And then we repeated the process. So we can see here that, for instance, uh, here we have the data uh, without the shuffling. So we have the beta length, we can identify it as significant. And uh, here we have the beta width, uh, we can identify it as significant in the Cetosa and Virginica groups. And then after the shuffling, we can still find that the beta length is uh, significant, but the shuffle uh, feature is no longer associated with the species of the flower. So you can no longer trace uh, the relationship between petal width and, um, and the species of the flower. So this is a, um, a method that we are still fine tuning and we still have to do the further test with of course, larger data sets and also data sets that are uh, looking more like uh, multi-omics data sets. So this is some of our first uh, tests, but we are open to, to any feedback. Um, so finally, I will end up uh, with a final recap uh, of this section. Um, we plan to improve, uh, improve MOOP approach to finding associations by using uh, vision t testing. It is a robust method uh, for null hypothesis testing that traditionally requires costly numerical methods such as Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo. But we can model the parameters needed for running this kind of tests um, using the by changing the architecture of our models. And yeah, we have other improvements on the works such as continuous, continuous associations and time integration. Uh, lastly, I would like to invite you to try our method. Uh, here's our GitHub. Uh, there's tutorials available. Uh, we're open to feedback and bug reports. You can open an issue or you can also uh, email us if you have questions about it. And I would like to thank, uh, yes, uh, my supervisor, Simon, uh, Stoddard Brunek, my co-supervisor, also the, students and staff working in the, from the Rasmus lab working on this project. So it's Rosa, uh, Valentes, Mark, who's in the room, and the other members of the Rasmus lab and co-authors of the MOOC publication. And of course, uh, Nova Nordis Foundation for the funding, the NNF Center, and the University of Copenhagen for hosting me. Uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs>